So good morning, um, my name is Barry Crushell, uh, the founder of the Lawyer CPD Club. I'd like to thank you all for coming here uh, today to hear this topic on leadership in law from combat to courtroom. Um, I'll give a more formal introduction to our guest uh, later on, uh, but Matt uh, Tully has come from the United States and he arrived here several days ago just at the start of our heat wave. One of the comments he has been making to me is, where the hell is your, your air conditioning in Ireland? <laughs> and I'd be saying, we don't have air conditioning, we have heaters. <laughs> you know, we never need any air conditioning. So uh, I think he's holding up quite well under the circumstances. So the Lawyer CPD Club is a collective of Irish solicitors and barristers uh, dedicated towards a collaborative forum for collective learning. Essentially, the purpose of the Lawyer CPD Club was to provide uh, CPD points to lawyers on a very informal basis and ultimately at no cost. Uh, and we would encourage anybody present who wants to get involved to reach out, whether that be in uh, providing assistance on the board or nominating speakers, or if they like speaking themselves, uh, then that would be great. So one of the questions that came up in terms of this topic is whether or not lawyers need to be cognizant of the leadership requirements when it comes to uh, managing or operating within a law firm. Um, a lot of individuals thought that maybe lawyers should be technical experts first um, and then potentially leave the management and leadership to others. Um, then there was the conflict between, well, what is leadership and what is good management? Um, and also, how effective is good leadership to law firm uh, operations when there is good management structures in place. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a uh, nuanced topic. Um, I'm delighted to be joined, as I said, by, uh, by Matt Tully this morning. I'm going to revert strongly to my notes now when I give you some background uh, to Mr. Tully, uh, just to provide some context to his experiences um, and why we felt that he would be a very good speaker for the, the Lawyer CBD Club this morning. So before launching his le legal career, uh, Mr. Tully served for three years in the US Army as a field artillery officer. He later received his uh, JD uh, from Brooklyn Law School. He's a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the New York Army National Guard um, and has recently chosen to dedicate his legal career to protecting and preserving the rights of his fellow veterans and reservists. Uh, on September the 11th, 2001, while employed with the legal department of Morgan Stanley, Mr. Tully escaped from the World Trade Center and shortly thereafter uh, relocated to upstate New York where he began providing his legal services to friends and former colleagues who were facing uh, particular discrimination that they had incurred while serving within the military. The practice that he established quickly outgrew his home uh, and with the addition of a partner in 2004, uh, Mr. Greg Rinke, uh, the firm opened an office in Albany, New York. As a result of the success within the federal employment law and military law sectors, uh, the firm then expanded into Washington, D.C. In 2005, Mr. Tully was deployed to Iraq with the 42nd Infantry Rainbow Division and was based at Forward Operating, Operating Base Danger in uh, Tikrit, Iraq. As Division of uh, Chief Operations, he was responsible for organizing and implementing uh, of the military security and stability uh, operations in Saddam Hussein's hometown. Um, he returned home in 2006 to run the firm that he had established uh, but was deployed for a second time in October 2007. During his deployment to uh, Egypt, Mr. Tully conducted a series of exercises in support of uh, Operation Bright Star, which uh, works to enhance the relationship between the United States and the Middle East. In 2012, Mr. Tully received a Purple Heart for injuries he sustained during a suicide bombing while serving in Afghanistan. His service there also afforded him the Bronze Star. His most recent deployment to Afghanistan marked the third time since founding the firm that Mr. Tully left his business to serve his nation. After nearly two years of decades uh, of service, Mr. Tully retired from the military in 2014. That's quite a biography, but it's only a synopsis. And I'm sure I'll be berated later for leaving some important uh, facets out. But I think in terms of the context, for me what was quite interesting is somebody who had established a, a legal practice, deployed overseas, returned back to the legal practice, and looking at the cross-fertilization of ideas and management styles there. 
So Matt, I'll try to give a best uh, synopsis of your military career to date, but I'd like to ask you uh, if you could start <coughs> this morning's proceedings by providing some background to your legal career to date. Sure. Uh, I started off uh, working uh, in the legal profession in Morgan Stanley, uh, primarily assisting in their money laundering operations, uh, assisting when the government would serve a subpoena, looking for client files uh, to make sure that there was no money laundering. Uh, I realized that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. I realized that I did not want to uh, be working for a big law firm, uh, so I rolled out and started a solo uh, out of my house. Uh, I had no money. I'm a, I'm a middle class, lower middle class uh, guy. That's uh, probably why I joined the military to help pay for college. Uh, so when I rolled out on my own, I used my credit cards uh, and I worked out of my house and I took any case that came in. So 50% of my cases were government appointments. Uh, in the United States, if you're poor, you can't afford an attorney and you're uh, running the risk of losing a child or going to jail, the government appoints an attorney for you. At that time, I got paid 25 US dollars an hour. Uh, and I took as many of those appointments in as possible. Uh, I also took in any referrals from any friends that I had. Uh, most of my friends came from the law enforcement uh, arena, which is where I worked before I went to law school, or from the military <coughs> arena. Uh, the police officers, federal agents that were contacting me were calling me about whistleblower laws. So they were aware of the illegal activities and they needed an attorney to represent them, to protect them so they wouldn't get fired. Uh, so I took those cases in and uh, the military cases were reservists. After 9-11, uh, the reservists got deployed in mass uh, to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq. When they came back, they were often fired from their civilian jobs. So I took those cases uh, and I pretty much made a, a good name for myself. Uh, the criminal cases I generally got were cases that none of the uh, well-to-do attorneys in New York were willing to take. Uh, they were normally uh, brutal rapes. Uh, murders, uh, aggravated robberies, and uh, I don't know how I did it because I did not have a background in that. I didn't uh, spend a lot of time in law school learning about criminal law, uh, but I was able to win several major cases. And what I learned there uh, in the criminal side is if you have a gruesome criminal case, you are going to be in the TV and in the newspaper on a daily basis. And by getting out there into the media, I was very proactive. A lot of uh, the more senior attorneys uh, would not speak to the media, they would have no comment. There's uh, ethical rules in uh, New York where I practice as to what you can say. So I knew what those ethical rules were and I said what I could say and I never gave a no comment to the media. So I always gave them a good 30 second sound bite that lo and behold would appear on TV. Every time that I appeared on TV, the phone would ring nonstop for several days thereafter because the lay people in New York, uh, they assumed if you were on TV and you had this high profile murder case, you must have been the best attorney in the whole area to get it. Reality was I was three or four years out of law school and I was terrified that I was having this murder case and for every hour of billing I put into the murder case, I'd spend five or six hours on my own time researching it so I wouldn't send somebody away for life for a crime I didn't commit. Um, and one of the first cases I had, the person was on, uh, facing 25 years to life on a drug uh, conviction and I was able to get the 25 years to life to 90 days in rehab and five years probation. So that was literally the first case. Uh, as all of you know, as solicitors, uh, you can be a great solicitor if you don't have good facts, you still lose the case. I had very good facts, a very weak government case, but it was high profile, and the guy got 90 days, caused a huge storm in the media about how the judges were being too light on criminals, and there I was able to, to be the lawyer that had the case. Wow. So that worked. Uh, I also took a, a case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court, again, purely by fluke. Uh, the Supreme Court had made a ruling that uh, there was no mandatory minimums on sentencing. So I was able to push this case up. Uh, it was a three-time uh, uh, felon, uh, which is uh, automatic uh, life in prison. Uh, but he, one of the charges that got him a felony uh, is he had a weapon. He stole a weapon and they charged him with weapons possession. Long story short is I was able to argue that the weapon was actually part of a burglary and not an independent uh, uh, crime in and of itself. So this person ended up winning his case before the U.S. Supreme Court. So I won uh, a case before the U.S. Supreme Court at four years out of law school. So that's unheard of. Uh, the fact that you, there's only 1% of the American attorneys are even admitted to the bar of the U.S. Supreme Court. Any given year there's only about 400 cases that go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that means there's only about 400 attorneys that would win a case. 
most of the Supreme Court practitioners in uh, America handle multiple Supreme Court cases. So of those 400 wins, it's probably only amongst 150 attorneys, 100 attorneys. And there I was, I was able to win that case. So uh, I was able to create through smoke and mirrors a very good reputation as an attorney. Uh, and that was able to, to help launch the career. Wow. Well, I know Matt has a practicing certificate from the Law Society of Ireland, so I am willing to take odds on him appearing before the Supreme Court here uh, at some time in, in, in the near future. I Barry and I just talked about that. I don't mean to cut you off, Barry, but it is my goal to have a uh, case before the Irish Supreme Court. In, in uh, America, it's huge, obviously, as I pointed out, to win a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. I also won a case before the highest court in New York State, which is very rare. Uh, that was more recently, about three years ago. Obviously, I knew what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm not going to lie, I'm not very good on the rules of the Supreme Court of Ireland, so I, I look forward to that challenge. I, I'm begging to get a case before the Irish Supreme Court. I had to look, look them up last night at half eleven, just before I went to bed, to confirm it. Uh, but it is, it is there, it's a possibility. I just want to go back, because there's a few things you mentioned um, in, in that initial opening. and it, it, Again, you know, to kind of go back to 9-11, and that changed everything, obviously in the United States, but it obviously changed a lot for you. Is there motivation to do what they are doing? They're on a particular path or a course, whether that's a practice area, whether that's law, whether that's a particular firm, or how they operate. Um, and they sometimes can feel confined in what they are doing. You made a very radical change in your life by leaving a very prestigious firm like Morgan Stanley to take a risk, go upstate New York, and on credit, establish your own firm. Can you tell us a little bit about your own personal motivations at that point? And I, I think that would be very useful feedback for, for, for many people in the room who are probably you know, questioning their own, some of their own potential choices. Right. Uh, we'll discuss the, you know, which way you should go uh, in a few seconds. But if there is anybody here thinking about going solo, do it. And we're going to talk about that a, a little bit later. I was forced to do it. Uh, I was in the World Trade Center when the planes hit. Um, it was a somewhat traumatic uh, moment for me, more so my fiance at the time. Uh, she did not work in the World Trade Center. She worked a few blocks north. Um, I had a court appearance I had to go to that day, so I was uh, entering the, the basement lobby when the other plane uh, hit. So our windows got blown out. I, at the time, didn't know what was going on. I just knew that I better go to court because anybody who lives in a big city in America knows when you have like one minor problem, it ripples around. So uh, not realizing the, the magnitude of what was going to occur over the next several hours, I, being a good person at Morgan Stanley, said, all right, this is going to cause some trouble. Let me just bail and I'll go to the courthouse. So I actually was out of the building uh, when they collapsed, luckily. Uh, but my wife thought that I was still in, in the building and I was at work. So uh, when you see the dust clouds, uh, if you ever watch the 9-11 uh, things, uh, the big dust cloud that engulfs people, that was my wife. She was trying to get into the World Trade Center to, to find me. Um, and she was literally there and got hit while I was uh, safe distance. The, the federal courthouse was about 15 blocks away. Uh, so it was more traumatic for her. Uh, I knew she was the one. Uh, we were engaged before that. Uh, we ultimately have been uh, married now for 16 years. Uh, but it was traumatic for her. And after 9-11, um, I'm assuming many of you don't know this, but there was also anthrax attacks. Uh, also a month after 9-11, a plane crashed uh, in New York, uh, not terrorist related. So that period after 9-11 was very stressful in New York City. My wife had a very difficult time going in to work uh, in Manhattan with the anthrax, with planes going down, planes hitting buildings. And uh, she was the one that said, hey, you have this uh, ski condo in upstate New York about two hours from New York City. Let's just give this all up and, and move up there. Uh, and the ski condo sounds real nice. It was a $30,000 shack. Uh, on the side of a mountain. <laughs> so a lot of people think of American ski condos and they're thinking a multi-million dollar thing. I was still poor back then. So um, after a few months, I quit my job at Morgan Stanley. We took uh, two months off. Uh, and I traveled around the U.S. and then I opened uh, up my uh, law firm out of the back of my house in a very, very rural part of upstate New York, um, which turned out to be a blessing 
in disguise because there wasn't very many attorneys. The, in New York, you can you know throw a stick and hit five attorneys. Where I was in upstate New York, you literally could drive for 30, 45 minutes without seeing another lawyer. Wow. So you mentioned earlier on about how your practice evolved, but when you set up your practice at that time, did you have any particular strategy? And I think what I'm trying to get from that is, you know, did you have a strategy at the time? And looking back, if you were going solo again and you were to do everything over again, how would that strategy change? I did not have uh, as good of a strategy as I should have. Uh, 2020 hindsight uh, definitely told me what I did was probably on the borderline of crazy. Uh, I didn't have a savings account. I had $25,000 on three credit cards. And uh, I used those credit cards to buy business cards to pay for my gas, uh, to get paid for by the government. Uh, when you take these criminal cases, it takes about six to nine months. So I had to float six to nine months uh, worth of living expenses uh, using credit cards. So when I say $25,000, that meant uh, that I was a practicing attorney, but I was eating ramen with my wife uh, and uh, drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> And is there any particular, if you were to go back and do it again, and if you were giving advice to sole practitioners or to an individual looking to go out as a sole practitioner, you know, based on your own experience, what are the key pieces of advice that you would ask them to at least contemplate? Have a written plan. So I just did it. Uh, and it miraculously worked for me. But I wish I would have had a better plan uh, I wish I would have done a little bit more uh, competitive intelligence, uh, and I wish I would have had a better financial uh, understanding. Uh, that $25,000 went pretty fast, and there wasn't anything else in the till. So uh, sitting back, analyzing it, and uh, getting a good solid plan, and having the financial resources to survive for six months, uh, very important. Uh, just a phrase you mentioned there about uh, competitive intelligence and analysis, and there's a phrase in the military, time spent on reconnaissance is seldom wasted, uh, alluding to the fact that when you are doing research on the market, whether you think something good came from it or not, something inevitably always comes off that intelligence that you pick up. What sort of competitor analysis do you think uh, small practitioners or lawyers should be taking on uh, those that they see as their competitors? Should it be their direct equivalents? Should it be those coming up behind them or those above them? It depends on what stage you are in the business. So if you're doing the initial launch, you should be looking at your peers and what works for them and try and figure out is there any niches that you can do. Um, for us in the States, if you're a general practitioner, if you do real estate closings in the morning, you do wills in the afternoon, you do divorces at, uh, at night, you're not going to be as successful as somebody who picks one area of the law and does it very well. So you have to determine what do you want to do? Do you want to be a jack of all trades and master none? Or do you want to be really good at one and have all of your competitors call you uh, to do it? Uh, so that's step number one. What, what do you want to do? Master everything or, or be an expert? Okay. So moving on from there, you, your time as a sole practitioner ended in 2004 when you were joined by uh, Greg Rinke, who had been uh, an officer in the Judge Advocate General's Corps in, in the United States. From that moment on, you were part of a very small team. How did the dynamic of the, your own operations change? Um, and was that guided by the fact that you, both yourself and you know, Mr. Rinke, had a, a military background? It, it definitely, the military background definitely helped. Uh, I speak uh, very direct uh, and blunt. Uh, uh, as Barry uh, has seen, uh, I have trouble, uh, in, in a group setting, I'll be, you know, I'll be on my best behavior, but I have trouble not dropping uh, the F-bomb. Uh, it, it's part of my sentence of vocabulary. So having Greg Rinke, who is not offended when you talk a very blunt way. Time is money in our profession. And I, I have seen in, in this country a lot of uh, puffery. Something that would uh, uh, take me about 30 seconds to spit out takes about five minutes. And I'm trying to figure out what is the other person actually trying to say. Uh, so having Greg Rinke uh, understand that I'm not here to, you know, 
tell them about the weather and everything else. I, I get right to the point, 30 seconds, and let me get back to building the clients. Uh, that was very uh, good. Uh, after Greg, we hired a regular civilian, and the looks on their faces when I spoke to them was, I was like, well, what's the matter? And he said, well, you said F like six times, and you know, <laughs> she said, get off you know, my ass and do this. Uh, you know, isn't, don't you want to know about my day? Don't you want to, <laughs> don't you want to know what happened last night at the house? And I'm like, no, is that billable? <laughs> So uh, having Greg and understanding that is, is, uh, was very helpful. And, and that's why uh, when we expand, uh, and we've expanded 10 times across the U.S., uh, starting out in Albany, uh, we built 10 offices. I always look for a military person uh, to put in a key leadership position because I speak the same language. They're not going to get offended if I drop an F-bomb. Uh, it just rolls off my tongue. I don't have to put that filter up. I don't have to spend five minutes uh, Relaying something that I can relay in 30 seconds. Great, that. Right? I think so. <laughs> well, Tully Ricky uh, formally commenced in practice today, uh, the 4th of July. Uh, again, for those who don't, who don't know, um, I'm a partner and COO for uh, the European operations, so that's where the cross references uh, come from. I previously served in the military, so that might provide uh, some context for, for some of the members in the audience. And we hired Barry. Uh, and we'll get to this, but I spent two years researching the Irish legal market, and I was having difficulty translating a lot of the American business model to the Irish market. Uh, I'll put it very politely, we're all very proper and conservative. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, generational uh, information that gets passed uh, through traditional methods. And I know I've overly generalized that. I'm looking out in the room and I, I, I see some familiar faces and I know that there are uh, people here that, that don't uh, operate like that. But we hired Barry to, to come in and give us a four hour uh, presentation on the legal market. Uh, so all of our managing partners were off site. Barry came, gave a, a four hour lecture. He came highly recommended from a consultant that we hired here. Uh, and during the course of that four hours, how many times did I drop the F-bomb? A couple of times. It was, <laughs> it was a bit unnerving on the inner end. Um, I'd been in Washington uh, for a number of days uh, and came back in the course of two evenings, produced 90 slides and an overview of the uh, Irish and European legal market. Um, there was a managing partner summit, as it was called. Um, I'm in our home office looking at this by video link, and then I saw uh, Matt Tully. You know, to use his own phrase, drop the F bomb on uh, Greg Rinky. And I thought to myself, wow, <laughs> this is not the place for me. <laughs> but I, I, I quickly came to realize that, again, there, there was a military uh, inspired uh, culture there, which I, I, I appreciate isn't applicable for all organizations. And that's what we're here to speak about this morning. So when Greg Rinky joined the firm, did you put in place at that point any structures that? You know, or plans for the future as to how the organization would grow and to what extent were they based on your own military precedents? Absolutely. Uh, what we realized is that the firm was growing much faster than I could maintain it. So after that first drought for six or nine months, I hit major case after major case, which brought in a great deal of money. So that's why I had to bring Greg Rinky in. I was working at that time 16, 17 hours a day, six days a week, and on Sundays I was working about eight hours. I knew, uh, or more likely my wife knew, that that was not long-term sustainable. So we decided, I decided at that time to reinvest some of the money that was coming in from the cases that hit in adding uh, additional people. I've known Greg Rinky since 1991. We were in ROTC together, uh, which is uh, the officer training program. So as a freshman in college, I knew Greg Rinky. So we, we, uh, even though we separated for a bunch of years while I served in the military, he went to law school. Then I got out of the military, went to law school, he went on active duty. Uh, it was going to be a good fit. We were familiar with each other. Um, so it, it, we realized we could not do this. Once I brought him on, it was literally within three months, he was working 16 hour days. And we relied on our military background of putting things in writing. Uh, in the American military, we have to have operations plans, we have to have contingency plans, and all of that is written down. 
And the reason behind that is once it's written down, you can uh, distribute it widely and additional people could do things. So that's when we started uh, changing how we operated, which up until that point was, you know, uh, orally. And when we started writing policies down and, and guidelines and procedures. So, so that's an interesting one. And, you know, if you go back to the military, one of the important aspects of any uh, operations is uh, commander's intent. You know, what does the leader of this operation want me to achieve? To what extent do you think is commander's intent applicable to law firms? Do junior lawyers, support staff, uh, do they need to know ultimately what the managing partner uh, wants to achieve? It, it's absolutely imperative to have a successful growing firm for everybody to know what is the short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. So at Tully Brinke, we have a five-year plan. That five-year plan is not top secret. We distributed it out uh, when we uh, develop it. It takes about six to nine months to develop. We make sure everybody gets it. In addition, there's one-year uh, plans that get issued. The first of every, or January 1st of every year, I issue a five to six page firm vision. And it lays out by department where I want that department to be in 365 days. And I hold the managers accountable to that. I don't describe how I want to implement. Uh, so a, a perfect example, uh, we're implementing a phone system, uh, Cisco, uh, and it's costing an, an arm and a leg. I, I'm relying on my chief information officer to implement this phone system and to take the five or six phone systems we have now, close them down, put Cisco in, and not have any lost time in, in the law firm. I am not a technical expert on phones. I have to trust him and uh, tell him what I want, when I want it by, and hope uh, and pray that he gets it done. Luckily, I have a, an outstanding team where 99% uh, of our projects are done on time and under budget. But if I don't lay that out in a five-year plan, if I don't lay that out in a yearly plan, it's very easy to just be stagnant. Human nature is not to change. Human nature is to do the same thing day in and day out. Our firm culture is never to stay the same. We invest 100% of our profits uh, back into the firm and into growth. Uh, you can't go uh, in 14 years from me working out of my house to 75 attorneys in 10 locations across the US if you don't reinvest the money back in. There's no uh, rich inheritance uh, that formed Kelly Rankin. It's been purely uh, hard work, grit, and uh, perseverance. Okay. Um, in terms of that organizational structure, we talk about different departments there. Can you give for an uninitiated audience who might not have uh, the uh, military experience or, 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 or knowledge of that, that you obviously have, um, a brief synopsis of how the military structure works and how that is uh, either replicated in your firm or the extent to which it is? Uh, I'll paraphrase it uh, to do military first. In the military, there are infantrymen. Their job is to kick down doors and kill people. Uh, in our firm, the infantrymen are the lawyers. So I don't want the infantryman to be worried about where he's going to get his breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't want the infantryman to worry about how is he going to communicate with his family uh, 16,000 uh, miles back in the States. I don't want that infantryman to be uh, worried about where can he go work out. All of those uh, non-door kicking and killing things are handled by other people. At Tully Rinky, I learned, uh, being a solo, I don't like doing billing. So I don't mind billing, but I don't like calling my clients and asking for money. So we created a billing department that handles all of that. So our attorneys are not involved in revenue collection. It's all handled by uh, support people. Uh, I also realized that I didn't like doing the marketing. I don't have a problem uh, speaking in front of a crowd like this, but I don't want to be involved in sending out the invitations to get people here. Uh, that's not my cup of tea. So we have a chief marketing officer who, who does that. Um, we had a lot of drama. I didn't have a lot of money. So the first few secretaries that we had were not the, the most technically competent, were not the most polished. Uh, there was a lot of drama involved. So I knew I had to hire a manager to manage the support staff because I didn't want to get involved in the day-to-day -day drama. And I didn't want to, to have to figure out who was going to cover for me when my secretary calls out sick. So we created, just like in a military unit, there's the door kickers, but then there's an S1, which is personnel. And uh, we have an HR manager, and they handle all of the HR functions. Uh, we have an S2, which is intelligence. 
uh, which is competitive intelligence and uh, propaganda, for lack of a uh, proper term. That's our chief marketing officer. We have an operations officer, uh, Greg Corder. His job is to make sure that the day-to-day -day running of all of the uh, operations of the firm run without attorney involvement. So we did create, we tried to replicate the military environment in the legal field so that the attorneys can focus solely in on the practice of law and they have tons of other people supporting them so that they can focus in on law. And that's what's made our firm somewhat unique is that our attorneys don't worry about uh, billing and collections. Our attorneys don't worry about the drama with their secretaries. Our attorneys uh, don't have to worry about how the photocopier is gonna be paid for or where the paper is coming from. There, there better be paper in the photocopier and there better be a, a high quality photocopier in the office. As Tully Rinky employee number one in Europe, I'm very glad that all that drama is behind us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> so this is unlike any American expansion. This has been uh, two years in the making. We can now open an office in America in about three weeks. Uh, we, we opened up our last office in uh, Austin, Texas on three weeks uh, notice. So going overseas, this has been an eye opener between the taxation issues, the currency issues. Uh, you're going to have some headaches, Barry. <laughs> about, uh, you know, you don't know, want your uh, attorneys worrying about the uh, if there's paper in the photocopier. That was a worry I had this morning at half five <laughs> when I was printing off the attendee list for today. Um, but to kind of go I'll bring it up with our operations. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to one of the uh, areas that you mentioned there, and you spoke about HR and. There is obviously one of the things that I noticed when I went from um, a law firm or went from the military into a law firm was the very different culture. There was an expectation that I had come from a very rigid environment where I was told the minute detail of what I would need to achieve on a daily basis um, and that I wouldn't have much scope for improvisation. I actually found it was the opposite when I went uh, into a very structured training program with a, a top five firm. Everything was very much laid out and there was a lot of oversight, more oversight than I had probably ever expected. Um, and I take that on board given what's at stake. You know, somebody is just straight into the practice, something's going out to a client, uh, it needs to be perfect. Um, and so what I really found was that in many ways, traditional, commercial law firms can be probably more hierarchical in an informal sense than I have personally found uh, the military to be. So there's a very different uh, culture there. Yourself and the other founding partner of the firm, Greg Rinke, are both coming from a military background and you spoke earlier on about hiring uh, veterans uh, and people uh, with similar experiences. But as the firm grows, of course, that is not going to be always possible. Um, and so you have taken on board a number of civilians and you also have a HR staff. To what extent have you been able to continue the military approach to HR? And at what points did you need to scale it back? We have done our best in HR to focus in on uh, what um, the American military does good, which is recruiting. In order to do that, uh, the American recruiting is aimed at uh, the American military recruiting is aimed at uh, uh, making it so that you're part of a bigger operation, as well as they're going to invest time and energy into in, into improving you uh, through management and through technical skills. So that's what we do uh, in our American operation. We have a very aggressive continuing legal education program. We're accredited by our bar association to teach CLEs. So uh, we don't want our attorneys going out to other, other people's CLEs. We send notices out to the bar in our area saying, hey, we're having a CLE at this time, and we stagger them. Some are breakfasts, some are lunches, some are post-dinners. Uh, uh, and we invite people in the community to attend the same CLEs that our attorneys uh, attend, and our attorneys teach them, and they rotate around. Uh, and that is an, an advantage to coming to us as we invest in your personal business development. We also try and make you part of a bigger uh, system. Uh, we operate in pods. So we have a partner, we have two senior associates, and then we have three baby associates. So that's a typical pod in our firm. 
and it works as an individual team within the greater good. And they're given uh, certain cases, and the partners don't cherry pick the easy work. Uh, the easy work is pushed down to the lowest level attorney that's capable of doing it, and the goal is to progress them very rapidly. Uh, in the American military, I was never a JAG, uh, Judge Advocate General, an attorney in, in the military, but Greg Rickey was. And what he told us, uh, told me, and what we've implemented into the firm, is the reason why he wanted to become a JAG is he was doing trials that uh, a civilian would normally take 10 to 15 years doing. He was doing it a year and a half into being a Judge Advocate General. And he found that to be extremely helpful in the continuance of his legal career. We typically take pro bono cases uh, in that uh, we give to our baby attorneys. So uh, we notify the judges in our areas uh, that says, okay, we have uh, Wendy Doyle over here. We think that she's a promising attorney. Judge, we will accept a case of somebody who can't afford an attorney uh, that's going to trial in two weeks, three weeks. Give us a call. You could have Wendy Doyle for a week, and Wendy will then go out there and handle that trial. The judge now knows uh, that the, the person's new. The judge is happy not to have a, uh, a lay person going to trial. Uh, so the judge is a little bit more friendly to Wendy than if Wendy was making $500 an hour to do that same trial. No other law firm in any of the geographical areas uh, that we operate in allow our attorneys time off to get that practical experience, nor do we have uh, nor does any other law firm have that type of relationship with judges where we can call them up and say, hey, if you got a crazy case coming up and you don't want to deal with a layperson, give it to us, we'll, we'll do you a favor, we'll do it for free. So that's the type of, um, be part of a bigger thing, help our attorneys advance. Uh, in, in the military, I typically did a job that was two or three ranks above me, and that's the type of uh, mentality we try to instill in our firm. Okay, great. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it out to the audience because I'm, I'm, I'm keen to get uh, people in the room involved in the conversation. You've been deployed a number of times uh, since establishing the firm um, and obviously in very pressurized, uh, tense and stressful environments. Uh, and although there can be no direct comparison made, I do know that a lot of individuals in this room will have been under professional circumstances before where they have very much been tested. Um, to what extent have your experiences overseas and unemployment and in those very life or death situations affected your ability to handle the stress that comes with being uh, a lawyer in a high pressurized environment? Uh, you have to have coping mechanisms. So uh, when I served overseas, my coping mechanism uh, was working out. Uh, I've been retired now for four years. Uh, I haven't worked out uh, in four and a half years because I got blown up. So I've gained a lot of weight. But uh, coping, whether it's uh, working out, doing something to get your mind off of the stress it is a critical element. Uh, you know, nothing like being shot at or having waters uh, land near you to realize the priorities in life. There is nothing that uh, anybody in a professional environment, a legal professional environment does, it's life or death. It's important and, and uh, you should have a little bit of stress. If you're going into court and you don't have any stress, there, there's something wrong with you. The same thing with me, whenever I left the wire to go out on combat patrol, there better have been a little bit of, of stress on me because it's just natural. You're not human if you're not stressed, if there's not a little bit of fear. But you have to overcome that and, and move forward. Have coping mechanisms and realize this is just a profession. You know, you, you're at some point gonna retire, there, you have other things going on in your life, don't take things too seriously. I'll remind you of that someday when you're going to the F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to do at this point is to uh, open uh, the dialogue to the floor uh, and, and I'd welcome any questions uh, to Matt Tully. This is always my favorite part because there's always somebody that's you know nervous about asking a question. But hopefully we'll get one out there and then that, that will open the floodgates. Well you know what we do in the States, if we don't get one, we just point and say what question do you have? Well, I'm starting off. There you go. And just why did you choose art? Excellent question. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it was not my first choice, it was not my second choice. Uh, it was a very distant third choice. 
Uh, we made the decision uh, about four years ago to begin the planning process to go overseas. Um, and our first location uh, was Hong Kong. And we spent about nine months researching how to open up an office. Well, let me take a step back. We're able to open up an office in America like that. Uh, I like challenges. It was no longer, the first office was a huge challenge. It took me two years to open up Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, then it took a year to open up an office after that. We're now in New York City, one of the highly, most highly competitive legal markets uh, in the world. We're in Washington, D.C., right next to the White House. We're in San Diego, we're in Texas. It's too easy. So, I'm only 44 years old. I view practicing law, this is another thing, if, if I can take a digression. Uh, in America, I have attorneys that are in their 80s still working. Uh, I'm amazed at the number of Irish attorneys that have like 65 on a calendar and are like counting the days to that. We don't have that in the States. It, it is, uh, people don't need the money. They just enjoy the practice of law and are going to work until they get carried out in the coffin. Uh, knock on wood, nobody's been carried out yet uh, from our offices, but uh, working to 65 is a foreign concept. But to get back to the original question, uh, we wanted a new challenge. So I figured Hong Kong was a nice challenge. Uh, after about eight or nine months of planning, doing the competitive research, uh, realizing that I don't speak uh, any other language other than American, uh, <laughs> it became obvious that unless I was going to spend a lot of money and potentially risk losing a lot of money, that Hong Kong was a bridge too far. Now, I don't ever want to give up, I don't want to quit, so uh, Hong Kong is still on the drawing board, it's just not first. So then we started looking at uh, London. The reason why, uh, after I came back from Iraq, uh, the American government uh, gave money out to veterans to go get technical degrees. Uh, for reasons I still don't understand, qualifying in England, taking the QLLT, was considered an approved uh, course uh, and paid for by the government. So the government paid me to take the QLLT, at the, at the, that's what it was called at the time in London in 2008. So I figured, hey, why not go to Oxford, uh, study the program, take the test. If I pass, I pass. If I don't, I don't. The government paid for it. Uh, lo and behold, I, again, I don't know how, uh, but I passed and I became uh, on the rolls as an Irish solicitor. So after Hong Kong uh, in 2015, we figured it was too much. We then looked at uh, London, and we spent about a year researching London and locations and uh, hiring processes and uh, the whole logistical support. Then Brexit happened, and uh, it kind of shocked my world because I did not think that that was going to, to ever happen. Uh, so we spent about 60 days after Brexit and realized that, one, it's a hyper-competitive market. Two, we felt that there was going to be a massive exodus of companies. So where else could we quickly look? Uh, and I realized uh, that I could become an Irish solicitor. I think I was an Irish solicitor after three years. We looked at how the law firms operate uh, in Ireland, and we realized that uh, it was an ideal situation for us. Um, again, I'm going to generalize. <coughs> the electronic use, uh, the remote office capabilities of law firms in, in Ireland was dramatically less than uh, in Hong Kong, dramatically less than in London, and far uh, inferior to the United States. So we were looking at what works for us in the States. We operate uh, on a cloud-based computer system. We operate on secure servers. We operate on phones uh, that allow you to work remotely. Uh, I enjoy skiing, and I'm able to get billable hours in on the side of the ski slope. Uh, when I go into a lodge, I'm able to make phone calls and, and deal with clients and bill. Uh, anywhere else uh, that's extremely uncommon. And uh, the goal of our firm is to allow our attorneys to work anywhere in the world. When I was in Afghanistan, uh, I was on the side of a mountain looking at Pakistan, and I was using a satellite phone. Don't tell anybody in the American that you're not allowed to use government resources for a long time. <laughs> but I was using a satellite phone to deal with a very upset client about something uh, on the side of a mountain at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, there. So I was able to get 30 minutes of billable timing. <laughs> um, so that, that's how we set up our firm. So looking at Ireland, we realized that our firm is unlike anything else in Ireland. So then we began to wonder, 
are we too far of a leap for the cultural uh, fit here in Ireland? Are we going to be so much of a disruptor in the legal market in Ireland that we're going to get blacklisted and uh, not receive any type of referrals uh, or be able to build the business? And we realize that uh, in all likelihood, we will uh, piss off some people. But generally, this market, the, the clients that are coming to this market, want what we can provide, which is aggressive, uh, type A personalities that can work remotely, that have a work-life balance. Uh, and we believe the hourly rates here, uh, especially in the larger firms, are overly inflated. And that there is a market uh, for mid-tier companies uh, that have a 50% discount over what some of the large firms here in Dublin provide. And then we looked at the talent pool and we said, all right, is there, is there a reason why there's a huge discrepancy in hourly billing rates? And we started interviewing attorneys and testing their technical competence in the interview process. And uh, again, Barry said, please don't be controversial. I see very little talent difference between the attorneys that work, you know, or the solicitors that work in the large firms, and the solicitors that work in the mid-tier and many solo firms. Uh, the technical skills are, are pretty much the same. All it is is marketing. Why does somebody go to one of the large firms here? It's a safe bet, you know, it, it's a large firm, they're, they're well known. But if we can educate the, the client base and say there's no need to spend $800 an hour when you could pay, or 800 euros an hour, you can pay 300 dollars or 300 euros an hour and get the same quality of work product at the end. It, it's a huge success. And, and you know, we hired a firm. We we interviewed a bunch of firms uh, to create. Even though I'm a solicitor, I'm not very technically competent. Uh, I would not want to try today or handle a commercial litigation matter in Ireland. So we hired. We interviewed a bunch of firms. We ended up hiring Ray Charles. I don't know if anybody in this room uh, knows who they are outstanding model and the rates that they charged us were a third to 50 percent what other firms the so-called you know big firms were willing to provide us and uh, to launch into a new country was very legally intense uh, getting law society approvals uh, one of the uh, part owners of uh, Tully Rinky Ireland is not an Irish solicitor and, and I was told that this was the first American attorney who was approved by the law society to own an ownership stake in an Irish uh, law firm. So uh, that does not come easy. I had to hire Ray Charlton to help make sure that we were in ethical compliance. And, and I just love it. That they, uh, they proved to me that the Irish market is capable of supporting us. The other thing that we looked at before we entered the Irish market is why are all of the attorneys in Dublin? Why? Why aren't there more quality uh, attorneys marketing themselves in Galway and Limerick and uh, uh, Cork, uh, thank you. Uh, I was just there yesterday morning. Um, it, and it is more of a cultural thing here where you don't have a nationalized uh, law firm. All of your big firms generally are here in Dublin. They might have a, you know, a one or two person office somewhere to facilitate a, a big partner. But what we want to do here in Ireland is, yes, have a core here in the docks, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 solicitors, but we want to have people back in Galway of the same technical skills as here in Dublin. Uh, and we want to have them in Limerick, and we want to have them uh, in court. But we can't do that if we don't have the infrastructure to support it. So one of the things that's unique about Tully Rinky, uh, as Barry uh, can attest when he did a CLE, it was via video conference. So this new Cisco phone system that we're installing, what we were able to do it uh, was a little bit, our, a little bit harder uh, under our own old video conference system. But every one of our offices have video conferencing. Every one of our attorney's desks has a webcam there. I can video conference in with anybody anywhere in the world. We see here in Ireland the capability to do meetings uh, in New York with an attorney in Dublin and an attorney in Galway and have them all feel uh, connected. That is what we're going to be in 24, 36 months, and I think that's gonna be the competitive advantage that we provide uh, in recruiting. It's important for us uh, to have two things, one clients and two technically competent attorneys. 
I am convinced that getting clients is going to be relatively easy based off of our price point and our connections with uh, the United States uh, and the business, our current American clients that are begging uh, to go into the European Union. Um, we're going to have the clients. Now the next question is, are we going to have the technically competent attorneys or solicitors to handle that? And our market research said that we will. Uh, and we want to be able to have somebody who can start uh, in Dublin and then two or three years move to Cork, or if they are already in Cork, have them interface with us in, in the uh, uh, Dublin office. So to answer your question, it was a multifold uh, intelligence gathering process that took us two years, and we realized that this market is underserved with the capabilities that we provide. The only thing that we're concerned about is culturally, are we going, are we going too fast? Is there a reluctance within the solicitor culture to adapt this new platform, this new way of thinking? Uh, in my opinion, it's only a matter of time. Uh, most of the other major legal markets, London, uh, the United States, uh, China, uh, they already have this remote office uh, set up in this team environment. So it, we may be the first, we may be the, the cutting edge, uh, but 10 years, 10 years from now, I think our operations are going to be very similar to how most of the mid-tier firms operate. Great. Hope I didn't take too long. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right, right. Time for one more question. Um, as an employer of veterans, what value and qualities do they bring to your firm apart from F-bomb talents? The number one thing is work habits. So in the United States, the vast majority of attorneys uh, study really hard in high school to get into uh, a good college. Then they study really hard in college to get into the, the legal profession. Then they study really hard in law school to pass the bar exam. And what we found is that socially, and again, this is an overgeneralization, socially they're a little bit awkward. They have trouble uh, interacting with peers, they may have trouble connecting with working class clients, they're definitely going to have trouble uh, interconnecting with CEOs. Uh, so what we try and do is uh, uh, hire military people because they have work life experience generally before they became attorneys. So they know work starts at 9 o'clock on a Monday and you can't come in drunk or high. Uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, drugs, uh, whether it's cocaine or, or opiates, is unfortunately uh, a bigger problem than it is here in Ireland. So I hope I don't bring that trouble over here. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is not an uncommon year for me to have to deal with a substance abuse issue uh, from a young kid who's now out on their own after being bottled up you know, for the first 22 years of their life, and now there's freedom. They're out of the parents' house, and they just do tons of stupid stuff. The military people generally got did all that stupid stuff in the military. <laughs> so it's out of their system. Uh, so the, the work quality, the work ethic uh, is much stronger. We try and find people that have gaps uh, in their careers uh, or a changing of the careers because we find them to be more well-rounded, more likable, more easy to communicate with clients, and we don't have to babysit. Which you didn't bring it up, uh, I wonder why. One, one of the key principles that we have is we get rid of the bottom 10% of our employees every year. Um, there's a common saying, and many of the, the people here uh, are dumbfounded uh, when, we, when we've interviewed them. Uh, they say, well, culturally, what's the biggest difference between your firm and, and uh, our firm? And I look at it, and they have 10 solicitors, and I said, well, Probably within the first year, I'm going to fire Seamus, I'm going to fire, you know, Stephen, and I'm going to fire Frank. And what? Why would you fire them? And I said, look at their bills. They're not making any money. These bottom three, the only reason why they're making their paycheck is because these other seven are, are working too hard. These three are duds. You're not doing anybody a favor by keeping those duds on your payroll. You have to get rid of them. If there is no accountability in your law firm, it's not fair. It's not fair to the seven people that are working their tails off that are not getting the compensation they deserve because part of their pay is going to those three other people. So bringing in accountability and getting rid of the bottom 10% of your uh, uh, culling the herd is what we call it. Normally happens in September. 
it's not a surprise. We spend six to nine months telling people we're not on a good path. Pick it up or boom. And then once you do that, what it does is it raises the bar. The attorneys that we have now at Tully Range were probably in the top 2% of the attorneys that we had 10 years ago. Why is that? Bottom keeps on rolling. When you see that you're no longer carrying Barry's you know, order, Barry's working three hours, I'm working 10, you see that Barry gets cut at the end of the year, you now feel good about yourself. And the, other, the thing for me as a manager that's good is now I'm able to pay you more because I'm not you know, covering for lack. So one of the other things that we've seen with the Irish culture, there is a strong reluctance to get rid of any of the problem children. And there's, there's revenue bottom children, and then there's something called the PETA factor. Uh, anybody here know what the PETA factor is? I think it's just an American phrase. Pain in the ass. So 10% of our total attorney force has a PETA factor that occupies 90% of my time. If you have a PETA factor that requires me to spend a lot of time on you, odds are you're not going to have a, a job within a year. There are exceptions. You know, if there's health issues, you know, uh, there are exceptions that require somebody's been a good employee for eight years, they have a slump, and, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But we take very risky hires. Just like uh, the American uh, military uh, hires people that probably not many other people would hire, we do the same thing. We see nuggets of hope and uh, progress in people, and we bring them on. And we put them through what we call a Tully Rinky Boot Camp. We don't tell them this, but uh, we put them in high strength. Sorry, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> the, for the first uh, 90 to 180 days, we give them pressure cooker situations, and we want to see how they handle it. If they're not cut out, if they're not able to hang, we let them know that this isn't the right place for you, and we help you uh, off board on, on the best of terms. So uh, holding people accountable and enforcing discipline is a military thing that uh, culturally does not appear to be accepted here in Ireland. Uh, and I hope that I don't cause a stir the first time we get rid of the bottom 10% in about 24 months. On that very positive note, <laughs> <laughs> we need to end this discussion because I need to discover what my PETA factor is. Uh, <laughs> you're good, you're zero. So, uh, I, I, I mentioned to Matt before, I said, in, in Ireland, my, my sense of how lawyers are appraised is based on a demerit rather than a merit system. You come in at 100, and for every mistake, you get chipped away. And it takes something extraordinary to get it back up again. Um, but the other thing here in Ireland that I don't understand, many of the senior partners do less work than the associates, but make a heck of a lot more. I don't understand that. It, just so you all know, in my firm, I am not the top paid attorney. Why is that? I don't bill, I don't, I don't make the same amount of revenue. So why should I be compensated the same as somebody who's working 16 hours a day? Uh, back when I started, I was working those hours, but now I have a wife, three kids. Uh, I put in 45, 60 hour work week. I should be compensated at that level. It doesn't matter that my name's first on the wall. And, and uh, leading by example is another military terminology. When you have uh, people in your law firm that lead by example, if they want to spend more time at home with their family, let them. I let them. I take a month off uh, generally in August unpaid because I've burned all my other vacation time throughout the year. Uh, but why should I get paid when I'm hanging out at the beach somewhere and there are other attorneys uh, working hard? So being fair in your compensation model is another key aspect uh, of a successful law firm in the U.S. Great. I'm conscious many people have uh, billable hours to clock up, so mm -hmm. I will let them depart. It's been a very interesting morning, and I'd like to thank you for the time that you've spent with us this morning. Thanks, Barry. Thank you.